that came out better. That came out better. Hey there, a cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. Today I'm excited to bring you a release day review of a book I love. It's A Lady for a Duke by Alexis Hall. This is the first book in a presumed series. They're Regency romances, as you may be able to tell from the cover, and it's queer. And Hall is doing something very interesting here with this style of the book. And while there are some things that didn't quite work for me completely, in the main, this was a thoroughly enjoyable read. First, the plot. The Duke of Gracewood's best friend is presumed dead at Waterloo, and he hasn't recovered. It's a couple of years on, but he's fallen into the bottle. He's having trouble with his servants because he's just become like a recluse in his own home. And he's doesn't seem like he's taking great care of his younger sister. It's about time for her to have a London season and there's been no talk about that. So family friends, including Viola, end up going to this castle to check on him to see how things are going, thinking maybe we can get the sister to London, give her her season, and they find him in this state. Viola is the best friend who was presumed dead at Waterloo, but she's not, obviously, and it actually gave her a chance to become the woman that she always knew she was, and Gracewood doesn't recognize her, so there's tension there. Will he recognize her? When will he recognize her? And this bone-deep connection that they had at Best Friends, how how will that survive not only between them but in the society that is Regency England? I'm gonna leave the plot there and talk about some of the specific things I really like about this book before zooming out and looking at what Hall is doing in general, which is writing an old school romance, the type of which we don't see very much of now. I like that Vila's transness is never brought into question. Yeah, some people when they learn that she's trans may not get it right away and they may grapple with it for a while before they're completely comfortable, but they never negate the fact that she's trans. There is some dead naming, but it's always with reference to the past. It's not done maliciously in the now, and it usually takes the form of family name plus or minus title, which is how people addressed each other at the time. In addition to dead naming, there's a kind of long list of content notes and I'll have them all listed down below. Every scene between Vila and Gracewood is gold. I love watching them work together, work things out, figure out how this friendship maybe might become something more, how it can work, and this is an interiority that I've been craving lately and I adore. While there is conflict all over the place, most of it is outside of the relationship, and I would argue that the main conflict here isn't between the two protagonists, but between them and society, because Regency England isn't accepting of a trans woman and isn't ready, especially because Gracewood's a duke. He's expected to have kids, to carry on a family line, and how can they make that work within the society? That's where most of the conflict come from. And yes, that leads to angst and discontent between the two when they don't agree on something, but the, like I said, the conflict is outside of them. I think you can make an argument that Gracewood and Viola are stand-ins for the ideas of liberational and compliance narratives in romance. And let me explain. Down below I have a link to an article by Racheline Maltese that talks about this idea that there's two main camps within romance, the liberation and the compliance. Compliance is where you bend yourself to fit the world. So there are expectations of you, there are things that other people are pushing on you, and you end up going in that direction and finding happiness within it. The example they give, I think, is like going and ending up in Spain and getting in a relationship there, and the expectations for, let's say, a wife in Spain are different from what it is in the US, and falling into those expectations and, and really liking it. On the other hand, we have the liberation wing, which is instead of bending yourself to fit the world, you bend the world to fit you. And a lot of queer narratives will take this track. And the idea is basically like, yeah, the world doesn't quite have a place for us, so we will make our own place. This is Gracewood. He is a duke. He has all kinds of money. He has all kinds of power. It's not that hard for him to say F the world, which he literally says at one point. You know, if he wants to get married to a trans woman, he can. He can buy off a priest. He can, you know, bend rules to make it happen. And so he is almost pure liberation. 
Viola, on the other hand, has a lot more restrictions. Not only is she a woman with the defined gender roles within that, but she doesn't have any money. She's a uh, lady's companion. She's working. It's not so easy for her to say F the world because she has so much to lose and not much leeway within society. So within the relationship, this becomes a huge sticking point because Gracewood is like, don't worry about anyone else. And Viola's like, I don't have that privilege. I don't have that luxury to be able to blow off everyone just because I feel like it. There are real consequences to that. So I thought it was very interesting how that works out. Obviously they end up on the same side by the end of it, finding something that works for them. And I think it reinforces something that Maltese says in the article, which is that a lot of books aren't purely one or the other, aren't purely liberation or purely compliance, that there's a uh, balance that can be struck between them and neither one is necessarily better than the other one. I personally tend liberation, but there are good compliance and narratives out there as well. It's very interesting. Anyway, if you have any more thoughts about that, you want to talk with me about that, let's get in the comments below. And like I said, the article is linked as well. And overall, Hall is writing an old school romance here of the sort that we don't see very much anymore so much over-the-top emotion and big happenings in the last 10% that uh, are striking and you gotta be kidding me and is that a sword fight like what's going on here type stuff but in the old school romances of the 80s and 90s you would have all of that emotion and everything and you would usually have a bunch of problematic stuff there would be some racism consent would be awful all of those things but Hall has kept the emotion and taking out the problematic bits, which I really appreciate. And in keeping with the spirit of old schools, expect dramatic scenes and purple-ish prose. I like Hall in this mode, but your mileage may vary. And now onto some things that I didn't care for quite so much, first of which being this needed to be tightened to the tune of about 100 pages. It's 480 pages now, and while there's nothing wrong with that length, a subplot is given way too much air near the, like, the last third of the book, and it really takes away from the core relationship in a way I did not appreciate. While Vila's transness is well protected, there's a baby queer side character that I was genuinely worried for because as a side character, they're outside of the happily ever after guaranteed in romance novels, and I was so afraid that their budding sexuality wouldn't be validated and would be kind of smashed to smithereens and it looked like it was going in that direction for a while and that was too stress, too much stress for me on top of all of the emotive everything else going on in the book. I was very lucky and received an advanced listening copy of this book from Libro FM in addition to the ebook from Forever and I actually started with the audiobook but the narrator isn't quite for me. I think part of it is that Hall has a very distinctive flavor to his humor, and if you aren't exactly on beat with it, it's not gonna come off well. And I know it can be done well, because the narrator for Boyfriend Material did an amazing job, and it made it even funnier in audio than it was on the page, at least for me. This was in the opposite direction, and considering all of the emotions in the words, I wanted to hear that more in the voice, and I wasn't quite. But those are kind of minor quibbles on the grand scale of things. I had a wonderful time reading this book. It was transporting, it was escapist to let me get away from my life, and I ended up falling in love with Vila and Gracewood and so enjoyed following them in their journey to find each other. It was just so great. So if you've read this book, if you would like to read this book, and if you know of any trans femme folks who have reviewed this book, I'm on the search. I haven't found any yet. Please let me know down in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!